Well, welcome to our monthly Field Notes podcast. I'm Jeff Weisenberger, Modern Steel Construction's Editor-in-Chief. And this month's guest is Ray Ripple, who is a world-renowned artist and sculptor whose work appears uh, all over not just Texas, but the world. Um, she was also a contestant on the Netflix series Metal Shop Masters. I believe that was last year. Um, thank you for being here, Ray. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, and I, and I understand. It sounds like you're you're uh, waiting for your son to do a, a standardized test right now. So I don't want to take too much of your time. But let's <laughs> let, let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? So I'm originally from uh, Fort Worth, Texas, but I literally grew up all like basically all along I-20. And if you're from Texas, you know where I-20 is. And so I grew up in Odessa. I grew up in, uh, you know, a little bit outside of Odessa. I grew up in Fort Worth and Dallas and you, I was basically a gypsy as a kid. So all of I-20. So speaking of roads, uh, and I guess this is a terrible pun, but what put you on the road? <laughs> To, uh, to becoming a metal artist or just an artist in general? Oh, man, it kind of just happened by accident. And uh, it's kind of like, what does Bob Ross say? Happy little accident. So basically, uh, I I don't know. It just happened by accident. I like, I always kind of doodled and stuff in school and like, you know, drew and colored and stuff because I was like the the little weird kid in school. I was dyslexic. And so I never understood what any of my teachers were teaching. So I just doodled all the time. And then it just kind of, I don't know, I just kind of rolled over from there. But I think I didn't really like figure out that I had any kind of creative talent until, and it, it's so funny that this question is like, uh, gets, I get asked this question a lot, but mm -hmm. I never really could pinpoint exactly where it started until mm -hmm. somebody said, what did you do before you started doing metal sculpting and painting? And I made cakes. And so I think that's where it started was I went to this yard sale and uh, they had a Care Bears cake pan. And my daughter was about to turn, I think, two or three. And she was obsessed with Care Bears. Okay. And so this cake pan was cool because they like the bear sat up on the table, right? So you had to like bake the cake and then decorate it. So I baked the cake, I decorated it. It turned out so great. The cake was not done in the middle, but it looked fabulous. It and looked so good. <laughs> it, that's all that matters. And so like, that kind of is like what started it. And so like, from there, people were like, oh, man, you should make cakes or can you make me a cake type situation. And so I started kind of like this little side hustle of making cakes. But then uh, where I live, like it's not it's not a poor town, but people want $250, $300 cakes that you get in the Metroplex for like mm -hmm. 50 bucks. You know what I mean? Okay, and so sure, sure. there was like no money in it. So I got out of it. And then from there, I just started kind of painting on canvas and on random things and just you know things I would find and furniture whatever and then uh, somebody brought me a piece of sheet metal and was like hey can you paint me a ranch sign on this and I was like yeah absolutely and it went from that to I discovered tin snips and bailing wire and rivets and started creating all these cool 2d pieces and then I wanted to take it to the next level and started you know, wanted to weld. And at the time, nobody really, women, women in welding weren't really in the industry, especially where I live, which is literally in the heart and soul of the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And so trying to find somebody to teach me how to weld was just non-existent. And then I signed up for a welding class and then they handed me a book and go back to dyslexia. Like I'm not really that great at reading and which is kind of funny because I wrote a, a book, but <laughs> it's kind of funny how that yeah. happens. But uh, so I dropped the class and just watched hundreds of hours of YouTube and yeah. And now we're here. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a wild story. I don't even know how it happened. It just happened. So, so what was it like picking up? Yeah. I think you, I, I had read that you had, you started maybe with a plasma cutter and then of course I'm obviously moved on to a welding stick. What was, what was your first experience like with that type of equipment? Oh man, I don't, I don't know. I just, I like everything I imagined it would be, it was, it was. And okay. like it, I just like, I don't know. I got, I became addicted to like the smells and the fire and the burn. Right. And like, it just, I don't, it just, I became addicted the very first time I picked it up and it was a plasma cutter that I picked up first. And so I just, I don't know. I just, 
I became addicted to it. It was just, sure. there's something about the fire. I don't know, the fire within playing with fire. It's just so powerful. And so, yeah. Right. And then harnessing that and making it into something beautiful. Yeah, especially metal, because metal isn't, I mean, metal is beautiful and it can't be beautiful, but a lot of the stuff that I work with is scrap metal. And so it's all found metal, weathered, patinaed, and, you know, mm -hmm. it has a lot of the Texas, you know, skies and weather and in, embedded into these materials. And it's just, it creates something amazing that was once trash, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Once just sitting in the field, like, especially these vehicles, like a lot of the vehicles I cut up are just field vehicles they've been sitting at farms and on ranches in the middle of nowhere for forever and now they have a whole new life it's amazing what a plasma cutter and a welder can do oh absolutely no that's very well put yeah how many you know how many hours a week would you say you you spend on sculpting welding painting just all of it i guess like work so to speak and i mean it sounds like your your work it sounds like fun but like how much how much time do you spend doing it Oh, uh, well, I do this for a living now. Right. So uh, my every day I'm working every day okay. I'm working and on something designing or out in the shop or finagling like every single day is work, but it's not necessarily work. It's just it's what I love to do. And so you find what you love and you learn how to make money at it is what somebody told me a long time ago. Yeah. And this is something I love. And it just, I'm just blessed that like I get to take care of my family doing what I love. And I just, I don't even know how grateful I'm so grateful for it. And so every day, every day, every day I'm hustling, every day I'm grinding, trying go. to pursue the next thing. And everything that I do too is so different from the the last thing and so everything i do is something new which i've never done before so every single day it's something new and fresh and starting over and it's i don't know it's kind of cool all right well so on that note um you know how is can you tell me a little bit about how, how your work has evolved over the years i mean are you doing do you did it start simple and just get more complex and then on top of that just curious like if you have like a particular favorite or if, they, if you kind of love them all in a different way, as far as your sculptures? Ooh, well, it has evolved a lot. Because if you saw some of my early work, oh, my God, it's so bad. <laughs> it is so bad. Like, I want so bad to be able to just take those things from those people and be like, let me make you something better, because it's so bad. Uh, <laughs> I actually think I just posted on my Facebook, uh, the very first piece I ever cut and welded and it looks terrible. I gave it to my best friend. And so she actually cherishes this thing. It's so funny, but and to me, every time I look at it, I'm like, Oh God, that was so ugly, <laughs> but, uh, it's evolved. Like it went from these tiny pieces out of like, uh, scrap piles within, a like a, a like a truck shop, like a mechanic shop to, I like, whenever I was a tow truck driver, I would find all these really cool, unique pieces whenever I would go on these toes or long hauls or, you know, that kind of stuff, or even at the yard. And so just mm -hmm. cutting that stuff up and putting it together. I think initially whenever I started, I never really thought that I would be doing this for a living. I just did it because my soul craved it. And like my, my mind craved it. It was like an outlet for me. And mm -hmm. so the more and more I did, the better and better my work got. But I think it wasn't really until I uh, was in the fire academy that my work really kind of took off and people started taking notice. And so that piece that like put me kind of in in that focus was these fire extinguishers that I used to do. I don't really okay. do them as much anymore, but uh, I was in this fire extinguisher class in the academy and whenever he started taking them apart and he was like telling us about all these chemicals and all these things with it. I didn't give a, I did not care what he was saying. I just want to know what these cans are made out of and can I cut them up? That's all I cared about. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. and then I got my hands on it. It just went from, I mean, I've always done sculpture work, but the fire extinguishers I think is what caught everybody's attention because sure. firefighters love memorabilia and they'll buy any of it, any and all of it. And so, uh, like that kind of put me in that right direction so people can see my sculpting work too. No, that's excellent. No, it's nice to have kind of like a signature like to, that kind of got you noticed to start with. But the, I, I have a few more questions about the sculptures, but I want to back up for a second. So you went to the fire academy and then yeah. also you were a tow truck driver. That's right. Wow. You've done yeah, quite was, a lot. 
Oh, yeah. I've literally done it all. I'm a single mama. So, like, I've always, like, every day is a hustle in my life. Like, I've spent every single day of my life surviving. And every opportunity I can get to, like, you know, level us up a little bit, like, that's what I did. And so I was actually a waitress in college at the time. And one of my regular customers was a tow truck driver. And he was complaining about work and how they never have any good hands. And I was like, yo, like, you think... You think homeboy over there will hire me? <laughs> and right. He did, and they hired me basically as a joke, and because they wanted to kind of see me fail as a female. And then I ended up getting on with a really great company after that, after getting my start. And you know, they didn't teach me anything. They just handed me the piece, this massive tow truck, and was like, "Hey, well, I guess you want a job? Go figure it out." So that's where YouTube oh, wow. came in, and so I work all these amazing, like, like build of cars like these classic cars like i became the the person to tow the classic cars because they like women are a lot more gentle i think with these babies than what men would so i've towed um and so many incredible cars that i've never ever seen before or people just dream of seeing and then of course i worked a lot of crashes i didn't do like repos or anything but i worked a lot a lot of crashes like horrific cr crashes out mm -hmm. here and in West Texas. And like, I worked this crash that just changed everything. And I decided I wanted to cross over and be on the fire side. And so started studying really hard and got accepted in the fire Academy and left tow trucking and became a firefighter. Oh my gosh. That's yeah, incredible. Actually, I left the fire service to do art full time. So that's where that was what I was doing before I became an artist full time. Okay. But are you still able to, like, I don't know, like in your town, if they have like, are you still able to like be a volunteer firefighter? Well, I still hold all my certifications and stuff. Okay. And I did, I did sign up to volunteer, but my schedule does not allow and it's a brotherhood and my, you know, they can't really, I don't want to try to like, you know, waste their time. I can't really sure. commit, you know, so it's just, but I support them. And if there's something that goes down, dude, you know, I'm right there. So, and they sure. know that. So. Sure, that's great. That's a that's a, I think that's best of both worlds. I mean, that's oh, yes. wow. Um, well, getting back to the sculptures, uh, you know, it, it sounds like you've got sculptures all of all over the world. I'm just curious if you got into you know, what what are some of the or maybe even one of the most interesting places you've gotten to travel to for your work. Well, I haven't gotten to go out of the country yet, okay. and so I'm still working on that part. But my sculptures sure. are over there. I'm kind of okay. jealous because they're going that way. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just haven't I haven't gotten out of the country yet. I just I'm on my way. But I did get my passport like a couple of years ago, and then COVID hit and then shut everything down. And so of course I didn't get to go anywhere. But now that things are settling down, I've got some big stuff coming up in the future that hopefully is going to put me in those overseas category and sure. some of those stamps in my passport book. But dude, I have sculptures in the UK. I have them in Australia. I even have a couple in Russia and like the, my fire extinguishers that I was telling you about, those mm -hmm. are all over the world. I have them literally all over the world. It's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. I definitely want to see some pictures of those. Um, okay. Well, and so uh, you were also, you were on, um, was it last season or last year? It was Metal Shop Masters on Netflix. Yeah. So can you, I mean, what, what is that even like? Like, can you tell me a little bit about your journey? You know, do you, do you have to apply? Did you get recommended? How do you get on the show in the first place? And then what was, what was it like being on TV? Well, they, they kept emailing me. And so they reached out to me and they kept emailing me and I thought it was a scam. Like I thought it was fake. <laughs> so I didn't even reply to the emails for like a minute because I thought it was, you know, not real. And then finally I was like, man, these guys are persistent. So I like emailed them back and they, they it was like legit for Netflix. And I was like, oh my God, okay, this is real. This is happening. You know that yeah. scene in like the office whenever everything's on fire and he's like jumping out. Oh God, it's happening. Everybody yep, yep. That was me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So, uh, but the show, like, it, like they started casting before the pandemic and then the pandemic happened. And so everything, the world shut down. And so honestly, I didn't even think that it was going to go through because you know what television is. I don't know if you know anything about television, but it's like a lot of hurry up and wait. And then, uh -huh. oh, wait, just kidding. Type thing, uh -huh. You know? And so 
I just didn't think it was going to happen. And then one day in like August, they were like, Hey, uh, yeah, congratulations. You made the show. Also, you need to build this avatar of you in just a, you know, a week or two, and then we're going to pick it up. And then also you're leaving right after that to go film for a whole month. (laughs) So it was like super, super fast, but as fast paced as it happened is as fast paced as it was to film it. Like it was, it was incredible. It was like, it was just absolutely insane. Like every day it was just like constantly, like, I felt like it almost felt like not in the negative, not in the negative. I don't say this in a negative way whatsoever, but literally it just feels like I got kidnapped and somebody was like, you're going to make a whole year's of worth of art in like an entire month go. And you only have 10 hours to do each sculpture. That's literally how it, oh my it wow. was insane. But it was like, it was it was such a great experience because I was very comfort, like in my comfort zone, whenever it came to art and what I was capable of. And it really pushed me to the limits. And I really learned a lot about myself and what I'm capable of. And so I, I'm forever grateful for that show just for pushing me. It changed my artwork for, oh my gosh, for the better. And then I picked up a lot of amazing things from the other artists that I got to, to be around, which is pretty cool. So it was a great experience. Very, very uh-huh. great experience. I, I can imagine. Well, yeah, like you said, not only, um, you know, getting kind of being pushed by other people and getting their, their pointers, but I got to imagine, like you said, it sounds like it was like a kind of almost like you were in a pressure cooker. So like normally you have your your typical routine for putting something together and then you have to do it like under like a strict deadline and with everybody. Ten watching. hours. <laughs> that's, we yeah, had that's... to build sculptures in ten hours. Wow. What the, he, I, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. who does that? We did that. I can't even believe that we did it. And it was like a legitimate 10 hours. Like, this isn't like television where they just pretend like it's 10 hours. No, sure, sure. it was, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. But yeah, that's literally how it felt. Well, and so, yeah, now, now that you, you, you described it, as you said, not in a negative way, but like the feeling of sort of being kidnapped and, and taken someplace and said, you have to sculpt. Now I'm wondering about shows like the Great British Baking Show. Everybody seems so polite, but did they secretly kidnap them and take them to a, a yes. in the middle of the English countryside and say, you must bake for me now? We never know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, it, I, honestly, if it's anything like those, like, man like it's tough it is not easy and honestly i didn't i had no in, like not that i didn't have any intentions but like i did not think that i would make it past the first round to be 100 sure. percent honest with you i didn't even pack enough clothes because i was just thankful to be a part of the show and my face be on netflix and people get to see kind of what yes. i get to do And so, but every, every elimination, it just like, oh, you made it through. And that next day we would go straight into the second episode. And so I would call my fiance and my family at home, like today's the day, like, this is it, this is the day I'm going home. And then I wouldn't go home. And then I'd have to like go the next day. And so every single day it was like, I, I just, I didn't want to break my own heart type situation. I was just thankful to be there. And so and I made it like almost all the way to the end. It was crazy. So going like, quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about murals too. Um, sounds like you've done some of those. Uh, are those, yeah. so are those like all over, like where, where do you typically paint them? Like where, so- you know? Most of them are here in Texas, but it's like a cool, happy medium because I, and I'm sure everybody can relate that sometimes when you're in the shop every single day, like you can get burnt out. And so like, it's perfect because like I have these murals scheduled in between like art and stuff like metal sculpture. So I can kind of get a little bit of a break from being isolated in the shop and go paint at this like public place on a wall where people can stop and we talk and you know, I get to interact with, you know, human beings versus being locked away in the shop, you know, so it's kind of a really great happy medium between both worlds that gives me a break from both worlds from painting to, you know, going back into the shop from going back in the shop to painting. So. Oh, that's excellent. So like, what's the biggest mural you've ever done? So uh, I think it's, the you can't defeat love have you seen that on the bridge it like Hmm. it was like 
there's this bridge that's in town in Big Spring, and mm-hmm. uh, it hangs over a railroad tracks. And okay. so I painted "You Can't Defeat Love" on it. It was during the height where you know George Floyd passed away, and like all what? of that stuff happened. And so I was just trying to like bring a little peace, you know, into our community. And so I put uh, I painted "You Can't Defeat Love" on this bridge, and which was probably one of the scariest, biggest murals I've ever done because a train came underneath the bridge at about 70 miles an hour while I was hanging off the side of the bridge. So okay. it, it was almost kind of like a graffiti type thing. So like I was hanging off the side of the bridge with a harness and oh <laughs> standing on this piece of wood that I was like shuffling through each platform and I was standing on this platform. I would stand on the platform, move the wood, stand on the wood to the other platform, like basically creating this little bridge with this piece of wood. And this train comes hauling. And I just look up, my fiance is the one that helped me move my harness because he had to unhook my harness and remove it every time I moved. Okay, and yeah. so, <clears throat> which is super dangerous. And so <laughs> this train comes and the way that the bridge is set, like the bridge is very low. So this bridge is actually condemned because it's been struck by trains probably uh, like three or four times. Oh dear. And so okay. it is very scary. <laughs> and uh, this train, I'm about halfway through with this mural and this train comes and I'm just bracing the whole like uh, bridge is just shaking and I'm just bracing. And then I just start crying because the train is just so long and it's so scary. Like, I literally feel like I'm going to die. Like, this is it. This is how I'm going to die. I'm, I'm yeah, doing like, something you love, at least. <laughs> I know. And so after the train finally went under, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. And so my fiance is like, no, you fought for this moment. You're going to finish it. And I'm not letting you up until you finish it. And I was like, oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> oh, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't that aggressive. It was pretty I aggressive, know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and it just, he helped me, you know, muster up the courage to, you know, like you fought for this moment, you know, you've been mm-hmm. wanting to do this for years. Just, you've got it. You've got it. Just keep going. And so I just kept going. And there were so many incredible moments that just happened on that bridge that, like I don't know just are gonna stay with me forever I mean that was the first place me and my fiance prayed together and then that happened with the you know the train and then there was another conductor that came and mind you we weren't supposed to be on this bridge either that train the conductor came and he he like parked his train underneath the bridge and mind you we weren't supposed to be up there and so I looked up at Josh and I was like what do I do and he was like just keep going and I was like all right so we just like quietly kept going And these guys were literally working underneath us and had no earthly idea that we were there. And then he got in his train, he gets ready to pull forward, he pulls forward, he hooks to what he's hooking to, and then he comes Mm -hmm. back underneath the bridge, and he's like, he's literally right underneath me. I can see him through his little engineer window, and Mm -hmm. he looks up for a second, does a double take, sees me up there, and I just gave him the shh sign. And uh, he, he like with his hands, like I didn't see nothing. And then when he went to take off, he threw me the peace sign out the train window. And wow. I threw him a, I threw like blew him a kiss and threw um, a peace sign out the train window. And it was just such a powerful experience. So that one's probably was my favorite and the most dangerous and also the biggest I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's a lot all wrapped up into one project. No, that's, that's, that's excellent. And, and that I did one, it all said, in three hours. So all of that happened in well, three hours. Quick. And that's near and that's near home too. Yes. Yeah. So that's really cool. Well, so our, you know, you talk we we talked about your kids a little bit earlier. You said one's 13 and one's 18. Are now are either of them following in your footsteps or either of them like artistically inclined? So they're both very artistically inclined, which is okay. kind of crazy and not something I like expected because I didn't really discover art until later in life. And so um, Chloe, she's my oldest. She knows how to weld. Now, will she do it? Absolutely not. Because she is such a girly girl. Like she doesn't want to be dirty. She doesn't like that. She doesn't want to get burned. She is just not for it, but she knows how. So if she mm-hmm. needs to deliver, she can. But now cash. He is, uh, oh man, he's uh, me for sure. Like he's always in the shop with me. He's always holding things for me. Like he's always 
you know, he's always in every sculpture. So every sculpture everybody gets, it's got a little piece of cash in it too. And then like he draws and stuff too, but I think he's wanting to kind of follow in my footsteps as far as metal fabrication. Now, mm-hmm. Chloe, she paints. She is like, but she does other stuff too. She does these really like cool felt characters and stuff that she like makes with felt. But like she started this whole like five minute painting series where she paints landscapes in five minutes or less. And it's like the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, Neat. I mean, obviously I'm her mother. So of course it's the most incredible thing I've ever seen right. in my life. But like, she's very, very talented. And she painted murals on her door in her own room, like for, and then she'd like paint it and then she'd paint over it and then she'd paint it and then she'd paint over it. So I, I, I found out that you were a firefighter, a tow truck driver, a sculptor, welder, painter. Now you are an author as well. Can, can you oh. tell me a little bit about your book, which I understand is called When I Grow Up? Yes. Uh, so I uh, wrote a children's book, I, it, which is something I've always wanted to do. And um, I think there's there's a lot of little girls in the trades or that aren't in the trades, but their parents are in the trades or somebody they know is in the trades. And so that seed is sparked uh like way earlier than i think anybody really realizes i've got flowers that are in my sunroom that kids have welded for me all over the united states Mm -hmm. and so that's i knew we had to have something there there needed to be something out there that a little kid can go into a library and if they want to know something about welding they can pick up a children's book about welding or at least about a little girl that wants to be a welder when she grows up and that's where the idea came from. It's my okay. baby. Well, that's See, I've been working on this thing for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and it just came out recently, didn't it? I mean, we're talking in early May. Yeah, right it, it launched on May 3rd and then okay. sold out everywhere. And then I just got uh, back from, uh, what is it? Hang on, I can actually tell you what it was. But uh, reader Reader's Favorite, I think. Yeah, it's called Reader's Favorite just gave it a five star review oh. which was so cool so i just got that back actually this morning that's incredible that's well oh, congratulations that's wonderful Thank to hear you. uh is it something can you order it on amazon oh you can get this thing everywhere overseas <laughs> if you're Good. looking to get it overseas you can buy it overseas now it's at on amazon barnes and noble book baby bookshop uh it's on Walmart and Target online. So you can okay. get it at Walmart and Target online. And I'm working with Walmart right now to hopefully possibly get it in stores. Okay. So uh, there's, you can get it anywhere. Excellent. Did you, does this involve a book tour by any chance? Hopefully soon. So we're working that out right now as we speak. That's, that's great. And so, you know, speaking of like the theme of the book, I mean, do you have just in general, you know, not only, based on the book itself, but just in, in your, from your personal experience, do you have any advice to women or actually girls uh, that in particular when it comes to getting into the trades? I, yes, actually I do. And um, I want like, so when I first started this, when I first started anything that I've done in my entire life, I've failed. I don't know how many times uh, over and over countless times I've hit rock bottom. Who knows how many times, I've done, I've been through it all. I've seen it all. And like my greatest advice to somebody that's looking to either start or they're just trying to get their lives together or just trying to build the life that they love. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And here's why, because if I hadn't failed every single time I've failed, then I wouldn't be here talking to you. I wouldn't be talking to you about all the things that I've done or the, all the things that are coming up or any of that kind of stuff. And so my greatest advice I could ever give is fail, fail a thousand times, fail a million times, because failures aren't failures. They're just simply redirections. And that redirection is going to put you exactly where you want to be in your life. And so sure. do it full sin and everything you do. Don't be a scared. Don't be scared to fall or any of that full sin. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out because something else better is gonna happen for you. But that spot where it didn't work out, it usually leaves off this little branch like a tree and you follow that and then that leads somewhere else and that leads somewhere else. And then before you know it, you're doing what you love.